All right. Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. And so today we're joined with a new friend of mine who has a theory of everything that I haven't heard of before. And so for anybody who doesn't know, my name is Ian, and I generally like to talk about the human design system. This is something that had a radical impact on my life. And as part of having a platform here and sharing knowledge and information and energy with people, I like to engage with people who are into things that I know nothing about so I can expand my horizons. And so without further ado, let's get personal. And so my friend, if you would kindly introduce yourself and welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm Toe and uh, the feeling is mutual. Like uh, I don't know anything about the human design system either. So maybe you can help explain a bit of that to me hopefully not like retreading old ground for your viewers or whatever but that might help contextualize some of my understanding absolutely i'm happy to share always okay sweet um you want like the batman origin story for my oh yeah sure go <laughs> for it <laughs> cool uh so basically so I wrote a book, um, the genesis of that was my older brother, he's a doctor, he's a really smart guy, he's like the smartest guy I know. Um, mm -hmm. And when he was going through his med school training, uh, he made a point of wanting to do a palliative care rotation. So. He did that and it, it like wasn't what he was expecting it was going to be uh he was surprised when he got there that it wasn't like this heavy dark sad place because there's like death all around you every day right he said it was surprisingly like light and chill oh. and like people are baking cookies and 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 then like not that much medicine got done oh yeah like it was way more philosophical discussions um yeah it's not what he was expecting at all uh -huh. and he said that in the time that he was there um he was dealing with patients that were like unbelievably bad like they were in the worst shape that you can possibly imagine. Like one of the, one of his patients broke his neck from turning his head because his cancer was so bad. It's like horrendous. Um, and yet, from his perspective, these were the most alive people he had ever seen. Mm. So he's like, there's something going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, these patients were extremely focused on trying to tell him something and it was like this weird sort of nebulous thing but he's like there's something going on here because uh -huh. he would have three or four patients all trying to tell him different versions of what seemed like the same thing right and like obviously it was important because they were using like their dying breaths trying to tell him whatever it is and then like they would die of course and then he'd be left scratching his head being like well what the hell like mm. what were they trying to say mm. and mm -hmm. so um he went on his own like spiritual journey as a result of this and whatever insights it was they were getting was as a result of them dying but at the same time they seemed to stress to him that it didn't need to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you could get the same insights without the terminal illness diagnosis precisely that just seems like one of the common ways in to these insights so sure enough, he goes like down the rabbit hole himself and he eventually, in his mind, he gets there, he sees it. He has his mind fully blown, like, holy shit, 
this is obviously what they were talking about. Uh huh. And he like tries to tell people about it because, of course, it's it's the natural thing you do is you try to share it. It doesn't go so well. Oh. <laughs> right? So then he he keeps it to himself for the large part, and he you know he keeps his sword sheathed, uh -huh. and um him and i so like he he sort of started feeding it to me piecemeal mm. and i would sit with it and i would stay up at night and and like really try to like think this stuff through like uh -huh. going inward internal dialogue like what the hell does he mean by that and then we had these 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 long email chains back and forth hundreds of emails he was in china at the time and, and there was hundreds of emails back i was up till 4 a.m just like email 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 anyway that ended up being the genesis of the book mm. so i went back over those emails and it fed the content wow so it's it's a nice way to get a sense of like what the thought process is when you're thinking this stuff through because you're getting a sense of like me on the cusp of it oh yes versus now it might be harder for me to explain it because i'm it's harder to relate to people the like the bigger that gap gets right um so anyway i'm going back and forth with these emails and in like January, February, 2019, I have like a breakthrough and like, holy shit, this is it. So I get there too. And like, I'm, I'm asking him about it and he's just nodding like, yep, yep, mm -hmm. this is it. So it took me a couple years. Um, I'm more of the wordsmith. So oh. I'm the one who like, managed like the book is more of a collaboration like half half of it is basically his ideas uh -huh. uh, he came up with a lot of the terminology but um i'm the one who put it on the page and managed to somewhat coherently i think organize these thoughts the, uh -huh. the problem is it's, it's basically an unwritable book like it's a it's a <laughs> It's a it's a book about non words. So how the hell do you write that? Anyway, the first that's... thing that comes to well, the first thing that comes to my mind as to how to write that book is to begin with my audience because if I have to explain the unexplainable, I have to begin where they can already comprehend. Yes, and I'm I'm huge on trying to meet people on their level because. I'm always defending against preaching to the choir. Oh, because if like I see a lot of I see a lot of these whatever masters talking, and and I know they get it too. But you have to find a way to package it in a way that will make sense to people, because otherwise we're just like circle jerking each other and it's not it's, it's not really getting the message to the people who need it right it's it's tough it's really tough and that's exactly the situation i've found myself in with my own sharing of information that's been able to radically influence and shift my perspective on things and communicate it in a way that's truly meaningful so i essentially i began with sharing the bright and the beautiful the potentials and the magic that's here and that's what lights me up and that's what's really interesting to me and so i began sharing that and in in reflection of the original manifester of human design uh, his birth name was robert and he he went by Ra after his experience and in accordance with his stuff is that nobody cared with the bright and beautiful and the light nobody cared it's the moment he started talking about the darkness of, hey, if you don't pay attention to the truth, there's these different pitfalls you're going to fall into. And here's me shocking you with the value of the dangers of what happens by not paying attention. And then everyone perked up. Exactly. And they're like, hold, oh, there's something here. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> or they're crying and freaking out and having these experiences. 
And so part of my journey into that is um, I've started to talk about what's called the not self and essentially the horrors of what happens when you're listening to the pitfalls of the mind, which is described as essentially the strategies for survival that we inherited from our ancestors that are no longer the way due to our unique new sophisticated vehicles ever since 1781 according to human design and rave cosmology there was a mutation that occurred and the vehicle we inhabit now is actually a bit more sophisticated we can reflect higher levels of consciousness than the beings born before that date and you know there's 90,000 years or so of the cro magna like mono or what was that anatomically modern human there's like ninety thousand years of all that baggage and hangover from them and so what i can do is i can point out like here is the main baggage points that are going to trip you up based on your own design which is based on the moment of birth and so it's been a quite a fascinating journey and it's really challenging for me to get into the darkness and to talk about the darkness of what happens when you're not paying attention and you're not living with integrity <sighs> So it's been a fun journey and it's a good exercise to challenge myself and hopefully reach yeah. more people. So much of it is baggage. Like people, people walk around with the weight of the world on their shoulders right. and they're collapsing under the weight. And I, I'm pretty sure this is what Jesus and Buddha were doing. Like they understood that it was ultimately weightless. So Jesus is like, come on, like, load me up. If, if you can't carry it, it's fine. I'll carry it for you, right? Because he knows he can carry all of it for everyone. All of those burdens at the end of the day, it's nothing. It's a feather. But you can't, like, good luck trying to explain that to someone, right? Like you said, they're, they're, they're listening. They're attuned to the threats, to the negativity, to the warnings, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, rather than trying to change their perspective it's like you don't need to change the way you think just know that i've got your back right mm. I, I can take it for you type of thing yeah so that's that, i think that to me is a genuine description of what uh theistic faith is all about it's knowing that there's this higher power that's above and beyond me and I don't have to understand it and I'm taken care of by it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's definitely powerful at reaching with a, this big wide arm that's going to grab so many people who mm, may not be open to more conceptual and heavy thinking ideas because like you were saying staying up all night contemplating these emails back and forth and uh, uh, arriving at your own realization could you say something more about what that experience was like for you coming in touch with this thing that apparently the the soon to be dead were trying their best to communicate and now through the the lineage of telephone you've given you've had an experience with that and so could you say more about that entry point for you yeah um i hear a lot of people um sort of wondering like is this it i had this i had this experience and i think this might be what it's, it's about and i i read some of these posts and from my perspective it's like man if you have to wonder whether this was it it's not that right <laughs> like uh, I call it my grace period back then when you like when I'm like just in the deep end and it it was not subtle like not even slightly subtle there, like there was no doubt in my mind like this is clearly what enlightenment is this is clearly what Jesus was on to what Buddha was on to mm -hmm. and like the problem is you play this telephone game where you you try to explain it to someone and then the words get twisted dude like the, the the bible is such a poor reflection of what i'm sure that guy was about well the the real irony of what happened to the bible by my perception is that essentially it turned into something that was translated 
improperly. It was not well translated. And so we have a circumstance wherein in the original language, I believe Hebrew or Aramaic, there is this word of say the Elohim, which is not a singular God, but rather a plural of beings. It was a life form. It was like a, a, a different species. And essentially what happened is that they translated that, that species and those people into the word God. And so right from there, there's already, wow, that's a very different game. <laughs> and 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 you, like so your jumping off point is already off base right mm. like it, it, if it was never intended as sky daddy like how do we end up like there's it obviously wasn't that <laughs> right like what, the the key well, thing that i think people miss is i'm sure that jesus he was his message was, I am God, and so are you. Hallelujah. But we forget that last part. Like everyone wants, it's like I talk about staying up at night, thinking this stuff through. People don't want to think stuff through. They, they want to be separate from God. They want, the, they want to be led. They want to be ruled. They want to be told how it is. It seems easier, you know? And it's like, if I could, if I could give this to you, I would, but it seems to, it has to come from within. Like you have to, yeah. I can, I can point out the direction and that's what the book is. It's a signpost, but I, I can't show it to you. Yeah. And so I have a question about the book. Can you describe a little bit of say how the chapters are orchestrated, how the flow of the book is? Um, so it's basically framed in terms of games. So it's all about the games that we play and the stories that we tell ourselves. And I think there's a lot of value in just sort of pointing out the main cultural game that pretty much everyone seems to be playing on some level. And that's the improvement game. Oh, yes. Very popular game. <laughs> Very popular game. <laughs> and, and like it, I break it down into like six pillars or, or like ways of recognizing this game. Uh huh. Um, but the, the main ones are I'm not good enough and I must improve. This is literally like the story of everyone's life. Okay. <laughs> and we've been carrying this baggage with us since like early childhood. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can, in human design, essentially we have a mechanical expl explanation for that pressure, for that strategy as it evolved. And so essentially it's described as the not self undefined ego strategy. And so the ego is equivalent to the will or the heart. It's one of the nine main chakras or energy centers. And so when you're born without having that ego fixed in a certain way, when it's undefined and you're here to learn wisdom around what the heart is all about, the not self strategy is I'm going to get better and receive validation from other people. Yeah. And so that's 70% of people basically who are operating under that theme. It's one of the most common and powerful things that can drive the not self mind in my mind it's 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 way higher than 70 <laughs> percent like, we're looking at like 99 plus percent because like if you if you really look at like why you're pursuing what you're pursuing if you if you dig deep enough it's usually based on a belief that you need to improve in some way or that the world needs to improve in some way Right? Like you could be doing the most noble thing, but you're still trying to, to change the way things are. Oh, what a trap that is. But, well, but because things are only ever going to be what they are. So good luck. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, well, I, it, when it, it comes to people trying to change what is, I almost have a hard time wishing good luck. 
But it's like, we know that it's dumb, but like intuitively, you would never try to change the weather, right? You wake up one morning, it's raining. You don't say, I need to make it not rain today, right? Mm. Because we know that would be dumb. You, you grab an umbrella and you go about your rainy day. So could you just take that frame and apply it to everything? Could, could you view everything as the weather? And if you try viewing the world, in the, you view yourself as just weather, something you have no control over at all, it, it radically changes. Like the world starts to make a lot more sense when you view everything as weather. Oh, you see, this is, I 100% agree. And it's actually why I appreciate human design so much. Because you see, I come from deep studies in yoga and medita meditation and even psychedelic exploration. I was listening to channeled future selves called Bashar of Daryl Anka since I was like 14 years old or less. So, you know, I've been, I've been exploring the fringe from the very beginning. And in all of my studies, all my research and everything, I never heard about this stuff called human design. And so I was exploring yoga and meditation and mindfulness, and I did all kinds of advanced stuff, and I was doing Kriya yoga twice a day, and, you know, it's incredible. I love it. It's fantastic stuff. And then human design told me that I'm a generator or a type, and I have emotional inner authority. And so there's a basic strategy that was given to me that I need to wait to respond to life because my aura is going to pull what belongs to me my way and I can trust my body's gut response of yes or no to be the sorting mechanism. And I have to wait this emotional wave because I have an emotional inner authority. It means I don't have access to truth in the now and instead I have access to relative clarity based on the state of my emotional wave. And so... I tried it on. It was like, oh, okay, I can wait to respond. You mean I don't have to like mentally figure out my life and go that direction towards success? I don't have to do that. I can wait and trust my body. You, you can if you want. It's, oh, it's it an available work. game. It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't I tried work for so you. Hard. I tell yeah. you, it was the most stressful thing I could ever deal with. Yeah. And being able to let go of that weight to trust my body's response was like, wow. Like I started to watch the movie and that's how it's described as it's like seeing everything as weather. I see myself as an actor within a movie playing this role and the real who I am is the passenger along for the ride watching this thing unfold. Yeah. Yeah. And so being able to be told these mechanics with all these details, because I have a very, very um, uh, detail oriented mind. And so I need to really cognize and understand the mechanics as to why before I can have faith in something. Mm. And so for me, all the little details and all the mind candy that human design provides for my mind to chew on and think about, it allows my body to let go and live its life. It allows my mind to let go of the body and so it can live its life and I can watch it. And it's been, it's been such a journey ever since, you know? Yeah. But like the rat race is fine. The, the improvement <laughs> game is fine. And it works for a lot of people. They seem to really it's enjoy true. it. It's true. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Because I, yeah, I, I don't want to say I have a hard time wishing them good luck on that. I do wish them the best on that. Yeah, journey. for sure. But what, what happens is for a lot of people, it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the problem is, so the improvement game has failed you. And you would like to drop that game. But if you would like to drop that game in order to improve, you're still playing the improvement game. So they don't know how to drop it, right? They keep mm -hmm. doubling down on the same game that doesn't work for them. And so they become like anxiety-ridden basket cases because of course. See, this is, this is why I'm specifically appreciative to the pranayama limb of yoga because it's what I found is that even after I was given this design knowledge and I started living according to my strategy and authority, which is the fundamental thing in human design, my mind could still be freaking out. And it's not that much fun. 
And so I was door dashing in California, trying to make rent when my car runs into like problems or I get pulled over in, in a stoplight that's in this zone where it's like, oh, that's just a trap. Like that zone, I wasn't even bothering anybody. There was nothing wrong there. And so my, my mind is freaking out about stuff. And it's like, what am I gonna do about this? And so what happened is I witnessed my body go into this deep breathing thing. And I have practice in like the Wim Hof method of breathing and such. And yeah, so yeah. I get into this method. And by the time I come out from that, my mind is in a clear state where it's like, okay, we're feeling all right. I've done the breathing so that my chemistry is good and my mind can't really engage in negative thoughts anymore because I've done the chemistry work. You know, I've, I've worked on myself a little bit just from some breathing. And so my mind is good. And then I witness my body starting to do all of the necessary steps to keep the whole thing moving and everything is okay yeah there's a difference between like the concept of of knowing something in your mind and like the raw visceral experience that you're having right so uh -huh. you can be in traffic and and having like a a terrible experience and you can know in your mind like oh like this is just temporary weather or the storm or whatever and that doesn't change the fact that you're having this really awful, horrible experience, right? Like <laughs> you're still having bad outcomes. Right. So like that stuff is just a tool. Like it's hard to explain what I mean here, right? Like, like no, no amount of conceptual thinking about wetness will be the equivalent of just sticking your hand in water correct right like th 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 there's a there's two completely separate things 100 percent. a, a ten thousand word dissertation on wetness cannot give you that feeling it will never quench your thirst like a water bottle there you go <laughs> there you go so i think a lot of people get really attached to the concepts and the frameworks and um like building these houses of cards and 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 mm. if it works for you then that's amazing mm -hmm. but ultimately what we're talking about is like and it's like this other thing right like you can't bottle the ocean you can't you can't capture this stuff with a net, like concept well, what, and experience, right? Okay, so this is actually what I appreciate so much about design still, is because there's this hypothesis. Since 1781, we have as individuals, you have a unique ability to reflect consciousness and thereby live and communicate in a way that's different from each and every other person who's alive today. And in doing that, you share something no one else could share. And we gain not a, not a bottling of the whole ocean. We gain a new bottle or we gain a new material within the bottle. It's like, whoa, I didn't know the ocean contained that. And so that's what I'm most interested in is the fact that we can hear something from another person that nobody else could say. And so that's what I want to hear is like, what is the thing you could say that nobody else in the history of humanity could have said like what is your thing what is your contribution to our reflection of the whole thing because we can reflect greater and greater orders of consciousness and i truly believe within this lifetime we can witness wonderful beautiful like paradise on earth kinds of things occur and i believe that we can and so i'm willing to to make a fool of myself believing of that you know i'm not afraid uh, are, of that. are we trying to change the way things are in order to arrive at paradise no i believe it's already the nature of what reality is right now there you go <laughs> right I, I i tend to agree with that like maybe this is paradise absolutely like if if things were supposed to be different then wouldn't they be right if they were supposed to be different than this then surely they would be and like you talk about a design perspective mm -hmm. things things were designed this way obviously because they are this way Mm -hmm. So, so are we, are we off the blueprint 
or are we precisely on the blueprint? Right, it's perfect. You know, it's perfect. This is something that I've always believed. And, and then I saw it in my own design, even the reflection of my ability to cognize that everything is perfect and it all fits together perfectly. There's this thing called the, have you heard about the I Ching? Yeah, yeah. The little like throw of the things. It right, like, that was one wings. of the classical, that was one of the classical ways they used it as was a form of divination. Yeah. And I, I have a little experience of that. I used it uh, in, what was it? In California and Hawaii a little bit. I would throw coins and ask it questions and write it down. And it was giving me these answers that were like, well, you know, I mean, fair enough. Thank you. And in the I 60s, this was huge, right? I think so. Yeah, exactly. The 60s. Well, the 60s were a shift. 1961, we had a bit of an energetic shift in, in the rave cosmology of design. And it said that we shifted from a second line frequency into a first line frequency. And so it became about discovering the foundation, discovering the inner truth, revealing these secrets. And then the 60s happens where people started doing all kinds of wild and crazy free love things. And so I, I thought that was really fascinating. And even taking a farther step back, Hmm, I forget exactly where we were going before I talked about the 60s. I Ching. The I Ching, precisely. Thank you. And so the I Ching, I was I was throwing coins with it a little bit, and I, it was kind of fun, and it was whatever. And then, essentially, I, I learned that we have them mapped out now. So in, de, in human design, we have each of the 64 gates or hexagrams from the I Ching mapped out with the nine chakras onto what's called a body graph. And so I could see that in my body graph from birth, I was given something called the 17th gate in the sixth line. And this line is about the awareness that perfected following is one and the same with perfected leading. And so it's this awareness of that everything fits together perfectly. And by this recognition of following and leading as the same movement forward, you're able to recognize the inherent interconnectedness and perfection of everything. And so it was like, oh, well, you know, it's written in my lines from birth that I would see that. So of course I see that. And of course other people don't because maybe they don't have that line. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. But what happens is you get the big peace and love movement in the 60s. Yeah. But, but now you're playing a game of love must win over hate, right? Mm. And it's like, this is another one of the pillars of this main cultural game, which is black must win over white. And it's like, you know, white must win over black, whatever, right? Good right. must win over bad. And that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> like if, you, if you actually won at this game that you're trying to play, you would immediately see that you, you don't actually want that. Right, you'd immediately go, oh shit, I, I got what I wanted and it meant I lost? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's crazy how many people are are still hung up on this like misunderstanding of yin yang. I mm. see I see people like masters with with tons of whatever spiritual experience, wisdom, mm -hmm. and they're still hung up on crusades. Everyone's on a crusade. Right? And it's like how how do you know you've had a good day? You have the bad days to compare them against. So well, thank thank God for the bad days. It's for me specifically as a experimenter in the human design system, as a generator, I have a, a basic GPS system that I trust. And so fundamentally, my sacral center is defined. And so that means that I'm a generator. And it means that I have a signature frequency of satisfaction. And I have a distorted frequency of frustration. And so I know that as a generator, by existing within my satisfaction, like I'm literally feeling satisfaction almost all the time, like every day. Like life is so satisfying, simply breathing if I need to. I just... And life is a beautiful thing. And so I know that by existing on my signature frequency of satisfaction, I'm part of the generating of a reality that actually exists in satisfaction rather than the distortion of frustration, which is what most of the generators out there are putting out 
mm. is that they're putting up with frustration to keep working and paying paying their bills and feeding their kids and stuff and so they're dealing yep. with the frustration and so i know that as an individual i'm existing in my satisfied frequency and that means i'm playing my part you know i'm proving that this place is paradise <laughs> And, and could you find satisfaction in your frustration when it inevitably yes. comes? Yes, this is the thing is that it's not like, oh, I felt an ounce of frustration, get rid of it, I'm done. There's actually, a, there's a major difference because there are frustrations that will cause me to quit. And there are frustrations that will just rile me up back into it to go in for the next round. Yeah. And being able to trust my body to determine the difference, that, that's where it is. As and a generator. You, can, you can zoom out and you can say, like, this is the blueprint. This is my story. This is how it's supposed to be. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean when you're feeling that frustration. If, if anything, it, it can almost enhance the frustration because you can lean into it even more. And it's like, yeah, I'm really frustrated, right? Right. And this is the driving force that pushes me into making yes. a difference. And yes. In watercolor, if you want lighter lights, you have to darken your darks. Mm -hmm. So, like the like the the more awful, the more evil shit is. You've got the other side of that for things to be even better and better. Uh -huh. it, uh -huh. It's not this idea that we need to be all peace and bliss all the time. No, it like, work. <laughs> it's a dystopia. It would be a nightmare if if we got it. Uh huh. It'd be an illusion founded upon. Uh, eventually, crumbling lies that would yeah. like be revealed, and that'd be a bad revealing. Yeah, it's much nicer to have a revelation that goes, oh, wow, you mean we've been going the right way and we have been trusting ourselves and look at what unfolds and we, we've had it all along. It's, it's right under our nose and it's the last place we'd look, right? Precisely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was so funny to me because like, like I was saying earlier, um, I, I never found design of my own accord. And then I was in California on my like yoga spiritual journey where it's like, I need to practice this yoga and do this stuff because this is how I'm going to take care of myself. And I, I finally have found some grounding force and a, a path through this stuff. And then I wind up finding an advertisement on Instagram and going to this two story house, like up the road in a different town. I took the bus and hopped over and there was this two-story house and they have this machine called the Kangen machine and like my dad had talked about these since i was a child and i didn't really believe it back then and yet they have this machine they have these super hydrating nourishing power shakes from this um this company called purium and i'm not happy with the the marketing schemes for these things necessarily they use multi-level schemes and stuff like that and yet the thing is the products themselves wow they're amazing and so I'm like in this two story house and I'm coming back every few weeks or so to get water and to hang out and chat and I'm learning about this stuff. And it's like, and I never found this from the hundreds or thousands of hours of exploring online. And to me, that was such a profound thing. And it was partially explained by it. Of course, I, I'm a, I'm a one, three profile. It means that I have an unconscious design that is pushing up against boundaries and finding the limits of things. And it is mutative. So it's bringing a change by its own nature. And so that can be kind of troublesome and it can bring trial and error. It can bring bumping into things. And so it wasn't until I bumped into this house and it was like, what is this stuff? And I'd be like arguing against it until it was like, oh shit, it's true. <laughs> but but we I need rule breakers, right? Like, and the first person through the wall is often the one who gets hurt the most. Precisely, precisely. And so it's, it's been this continual journey of self-discovery for myself and being able to witness and explore. And, you know, it's been fun, very satisfying. I've been able to experience much less frustration and much less pain overall as a result of trusting myself and following my inner authority. And so for me, it's been, it's a joy. Not every day, you know, like you're saying, there are still bad days. The thing is, is I find myself more able to appreciate them nowadays. Yep. Yeah. And it doesn't make them not bad. They're, right. they're, they're still really bad, but you, like can still suck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you can appreciate the suckiness of it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Like, man, this really sucks. Like, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And like, maybe that's not a problem. Right. It goes back to even farther back in my own history. Like I was, I was meant, I mentioned Bashar. I don't know if you've heard of Bashar. No. Yeah. It's, um, 
been quite an experience because he taught me many things from childhood that helped me to be present on the earth in the world as it is today <laughs> to say the least and part of it was this thing called the rubber band effect the rubber band effect and so essentially there's this description that as human beings we are masters of limitation and so as part of this limitation mastery one of the things we do is we go as far into the darkness as we can possibly handle we go as far into the depths of the horrors and the evils and the grossness as possible until there's a snap and it's not the rubber band snapping and we fall deeper into it it's the rubber band slingshotting us over to the other end and that becomes this trajectory into the light into the bliss into the acceptance of what is and nature of what it is to be human and have your own limitations and being able to see the light of that rather than the dark of it and we have to dig into the very rock bottom of the dark first before we activate that slingshot effect or that building back up but no one wants to dig and that's dangerous that's so dangerous like the, uh, now you're vulnerable to being handed down like s someone else will will give you a set of rules to live by but people don't know that you can just take that set of rules and light it on fire mm -hmm. and, and live by whatever rules you want like yeah obviously if you're if you're living in a society you you're going to experience the the outcomes oh yeah there's of, consequences right like you probably didn't want to be door dashing to pay your rent but you know at a certain oh. point that's the name of the game right but if your if your current stories and your current rules aren't working for you you can just change them you can right. come up with new stories right uh-huh right you don't have to play that game you really don't no any and old I, game or old story that's holding you back it's probably worthy of reevaluation and and the problem is people say they want to get rid of their old stories that aren't serving them but when you give them the opportunity to they cling on for dear life oh, yeah. right it's like well it's some easy for you to stay do. you know some of them do and this is where i it, it takes me even into yoga there was this term i was given from ancient sanskrit called aparigraha and it essentially has to do with the knowing of when it is correct to accept or receive a gift and when it is not correct to accept or give a gift and so when it comes to this this knowledge when it comes to having some mind opening or truly digging deep into the truth of the matter oh, well at this point for myself i allow sleeping dogs to lie and there are those that are like half awake who are starting to notice and all you got to do is like shine a bright light on them for a second and they're like whoa what happened whoa hey hold, what's going on yeah and so I let the sleepers sleep. And when it's those who are like half awake, it's like, hey, you there? Well, like you, you have to be looking for it on some level if you want to find it. Like, there's no point. It's this idea that like a Zen monastery doesn't recruit. They, they build the temple on the mountain, they sweep the floors, and they wait. They wait for the students to appear because in a perfect world you would be coming to me and and giving me some power not for me to abuse but you need to have some skin in the game you need to be invested you need to be looking for it on some level mm -hmm. because if you're not you're just gonna say me like I don't really care like maybe not and you're right like right i don't know what the hell i'm talking about either <laughs> but but you came to me right presumably you're not satisfied so mm. that's the big question is are you satisfied mm. and a lot of people aren't right and, and that was a big part of your story right the satisfaction frustration dynamic exactly would you say that's like the point of human design for you oh my gosh like and again i'm going to point to around a 70 percent of people 
And it's funny that it's the same as the heart. About 70% of people are generators. And so for 70% of people, that's their dichotomy. That's their, are you frustrated or are you satisfied? This is life or death. Like, do you care about life or not? Like, and so, yeah, for a lot of people, it is that way. And then in human, in human design, there's the description of three other types of human auras that we have. Essentially, what the aura does is it describes the way in which we interact and move through space-time. And so generator being the fundamental mechanic. Manifester being the classical king, patriarch, leader, ruler, amander. Like, I am informing you of how it is. And that's the manifester's way. <laughs> At least it was. They used to be the kings. They used to be the top. They're no longer the top. And I'll say who's the top in a moment. Are, are the generators making it so when they receive orders? Well, yeah, they're just doing what they're told. You know, yeah. they're going, okay, okay. Yeah. And so the manifester makes up around, what is it? I think about 8% of people nowadays. And then the smallest one is the reflector type. This is around 2% of people at most. The reflector would operate as like the advisor or the mage or this, um, this force that would hang around one of the manifestor leaders and they would be maybe the alchemist. They would have this connection to things that is different because the reflector, they're a completely different type of thing than the rest of us. Like. <laughs> Uh, the, the other three types are all solar beings. We operate primarily from the information through the sun, whereas the reflectors are lunar beings and they operate on a 28-day cycle of correct decision-making. And so for them, they really have to wait a long time and work with the moon and the moon cycles. And the new type that's on the top that is now the most advanced and the newest to be born in human design, they were first born in 1781, is the projector type. That makes up around 20% of people. And the projector type is very fascinating because essentially what they're able to do is they're able to see into the essence of things and the essence of another person specifically. It is primarily one person at a time. And so their signature, instead of frustration, satisfaction of the generator, the signature for the projector is on the not self, on the distorted side, it's called bitterness. Mm -hmm. Because they can see so clearly into the nature of things that their only way to express it out when they don't know what's going on is just, I'm bitter about this because it could be better. And we could fix this like this. And oh, this is so stupid because this could be better. And, and so they can actually rise up and find their signature of success which is their signature frequency is literally success itself. <laughs> and so they can actually learn to let go of that bitterness and to express that those sharp keynotes of success in a way that is no longer like this heavy, bitter load that's weighing things down. And, and yeah, for the manifester, it's anger. That's their not self theme. So they have true anger about things and rage. And their true signature is peace. <laughs> Legit peace. Like, I'm at peace. This is what my thing is. This is all good. <laughs> and for the reflector, their, their distorted field is disappointment. Because the reflector has this ability to see into the patterns of the people that make up societies. So they have... Every personal relationship for them is almost like this archetypical relationship that is extrapolated into as a part of society. And so they kind of operate as these, well, one description is, you know, when they go down on mines and they're mining underground and they have a canary in the mine and if the canary dies, they yeah. gotta get out. Yeah. The reflector is able to pick up on stuff way ahead of time. And so it's going, hey, we gotta fix this shit. That's not okay. And so disappointment is, oh, hey, it, it fits into this normal whatever pattern, and it's stupid too. Okay, that's disappointing. Or surprise, that's their signature, is, wow, surprising, look at that. And there's, the, um, there's, there's this woman named Bibi in the human design server that I, um, I'm one of the administrators of. And from her life, like looking at her life, 
as she describes it through the bits and pieces you can see online. It's like she's living a fairy tale. <laughs> How so? Well, it's like she's doing these big catering orders for groups where she gets to make all this food. She has her own gardening business where she's working in, in the garden all the time. And she's going on all these like interesting dates with really interesting people. And they've got all these like magical connections with history and big forces. And well, she's really smart, you know, and like we've had conversations and such. And so I can tell she's really intelligent as a person. And, she really fights for what she believes in. And I can just see it from there. And it's just like, it looks like you're living in a fairy tale from here, you know? Mm. And that's the signature of what the reflector is, a surprise. And from my perspective, it looks like that is a surprising life. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. She also plays like the, the cello, I think it is, or the violin or the, the harp. The harp is what she plays. Yeah. Like a big old harp. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, mm. I can go off and on about this stuff all day, so. Yeah, no, it's cool. But, like, what do you ultimately think all of that stuff is about? Like, dig down to, like, the bedrock. Well, essentially what it is, is that it is the science of differentiation. And so the point is that you are a unique being and you can reflect consciousness unlike any other being. And what I want to do is to interact with you in a way that brings that about, is to mm. hear the things that only you could say. Because there are things only you could say, only things only you can see. Because you have a unique vantage point out of everything. So you're just setting the stage for this to unfold. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. I, I, I can't force anything to happen. You know, I'm not a manifester. I can't go out there and manifest reality and then let you know, hey, this is what I'm going to do and then make it happen. I, I don't operate that way. Forcing something is a great way to kill it, right? Right, right. Yeah. I, I, and it's not for me. And so I, I trust and I've witnessed my response system in action. Like I was living in that house I told you about that introduced me to design. I was living in there for a few months, not officially on the lease or anything. And so I'm chilling in my room for a few hours in the morning, like playing a video game or watching a cartoon or something and thinking the whole time, like, I really need to get up and do this errand. There's an errand I'm going to do. And I really want to do this errand. And I, I should do it. I, I need to do this errand. It's the right thing to do. And I'm like hanging out, playing this game, having fun. And then all of a sudden, whoop, I notice I stand up and it's like, oh, oh, I'm standing up. Okay. I guess we're moving. Things are happening now. And so Taking I care up. of itself. Exactly. Well, the thing was, is too, is that's not all, is that I got up and I did my thing and I was gone maybe 45 minutes or so and I come back and lo and behold, in the time period that I was gone, the landlord had illegally entered the place, had a moment and left before I showed up. So your, you, <laughs> your <laughs> intuition to get up and leave at that moment. <laughs> was spot on <laughs> precisely and this is what i found is one of the things i've been seeking for a long time is synchronicity this notion that there is an ever-present connection in reality and you can see the interconnectedness of things and you can almost see the entire universe give you a little wink of hey look at that isn't that yep. cool yeah and so i've always been like how do i make this a commonplace thing because I've experienced it before and I want it to be like an ordinary thing. I love that feeling. I don't want it to be some like oh, once in a blue moon. Wow. You know, I'm alive. Yeah. I want to feel alive all the time. And it wasn't until the specific keynotes and the experimentation with my own inner authority and type strategy that I started to feel like I, I'm living mythology. Like my mind started to relax. Because the thing is, is the basic function is that my mind is no longer allowed to tell my body what to do. That's the basic function. And so since my mind is no longer in charge of decision making, it is instead able to reflect what it sees without distortion. Living mythology. That's yes. That's nice. <laughs> I like Even that. every one of us. You know, you have mythology in your genes. It's what you are. You can yeah. live it, you know, and yeah, yeah. Wow. Like life but is a beautiful like, thing. We 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 doubt ourselves so much, right? You talk about trusting the yes, no, and it's like obviously I'm getting up for a reason. So 
I'm just going to do whatever this is. A, like, like, let's explore what this is about. Precisely. And then you get back and you're like, oh, that's what that was about. Mm -hmm. right? And I got to tell you, this thing is, I, I mentioned my 1-3 profile before. So I have this third line unconscious and I have a first line conscious personality. It means that who I think I am, part of how that functions is an investigator. I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to understand what's going on so that I'm not afraid anymore. And essentially, you know, I'd be arguing against it. I felt the yes and no. And then I've went, well, forget about it. You know, I'm going to do what I want. And then I'm like sick for a week or something. Uh -huh. Or I get into a car accident or something, you know, it's like serious stuff happens. And it's like, well, I guess that's why I trust myself and I shouldn't listen to my mind. <laughs> it's not yeah. here to tell me what to do. It's here to reflect with other people what I see, you know, I mean, that's what it's here for. Yeah. And then also, also at the most level of sophistication, it becomes my own entertainment. Like you the thing you talk about, like being the actor in the play, right? Exactly. You get to watch. Mm -hmm. And I can watch my own actor do his play and that entertains my passenger. It entertains me who's watching. And it's like, wow, look at that. You know, like sometimes it's like, oh, that was a really good one. Or sometimes it was like, did you really say that? Or did you really type that? Like, dude, seriously? Yeah, I, I guess I did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I don't like I don't beat myself up about it. I don't allow myself beat yourself up. Precisely. Bingo. It's, a waste, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of imagination. It's a waste of what you can do with your with your thinking, cognizing brain, mind thing. Yeah. <laughs> like we can do so much with these things. Like they're incredible. Like, if you look for reasons to beat yourself up, you will find plenty, plenty. You see, this is the thing is when I was, I was, I remember describing this when I was first into Buddhism, there was actually, it was a specific sect. It was the Soka Gakkai school for Nichiren. Oh, I lost it. You lost your connection, eh? Where did it go? You still seem okay on my end. Oh, really? It's still yeah. here? It got like okay, a, that's so funny. it got choppy for like one second. Okay, yeah, I still don't see any of the cameras. However, you can hear me. Yep, you're good. Okay, wonderful. So, um, yeah, it was the, the Nichiren sect of Buddhism, wherein we were chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, which is devotion to the mystic law of cause and effect through sound. And I was describing something I had found earlier in my exploration within myself, I found the pit of eternal sadness. And if I wanted to engage with it, I can make myself more and more and more sad forever. Mm. And so eventually the theory popped into my head. It was like, whoa, wait a second. If the pit of eternal sadness exists, there must also be the exact opposite. Oh, there's the connection. Oh, I guess it's just me now. We'll let him reconnect. Hello? He's back. Yo. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep. Wonderful. Could you say where I was at? Oh. The pit of eternal sadness. Yes. Essentially, I had found this thing called the pit of eternal sadness within myself. It was like a pattern of thinking that could perpetually make myself more and more sad.
Oh, it's still choppy. Yes. Seems to be there's a bit of a bug there. Yeah. So funny. Yeah, that's like, oh, such a core moment in my own story and my experience. <laughs> well, maybe there's a reason. Is that is that the universe winking? Is it saying, right? Do we go with it? Do we adjourn? It easily know. can be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's see. Let's see. Well, I'll give it a moment at least. Okay. I'll see if it's stable. Because it, it does seem like it's doing okay at the moment. Yeah. Uh, like the resolution has dropped, but I can hear you. Okay. So you're still getting stuttering on your side? A little bit. A little bit. Okay, I'll do one more. Okay, so if we have stability here, this would be with the higher resolution, I figure. Seems good. Dink. Dink. Yeah. Okay, so essentially... I discovered the pit of eternal sadness within myself and it was basically a, a pattern of thinking that would allow myself to indulge in becoming more and more and more and more and more and more and more sad. And I could just keep pressing that button to get sadder Positive and sadder and sadder. Loop. Right. And so I could do that. And I was like, wow, wait a second. If I can do that, the opposite must also be possible. There must be a, there must be some kind of a pattern of thinking that can allow me to rise up towards higher and higher states of joy and even bliss. There must be, there, that must exist. If you can and spiral down, you can spiral up. <laughs> precisely. And it was in that moment that it was like, there was this journey born within me of, oh, okay, well, I'm going to discover the mechanics of that. I'm going to learn how that works one way or the other, spiraling up and down. And I'm going to learn how to communicate that to anyone. I'm going to learn it within my own body to the point where I don't have to experience unnecessary sadness, like true sadness, of course, wonderful. And I don't have to experience unnecessary sadness anymore. And I want to be able to teach that so that nobody has to have unnecessary sadness or despair or just like torturing themselves. It doesn't have to happen. You know, you can learn to think differently. We've learned that our, our brain and our mind is like plastic. You can transform and change and all kinds of different magical things can happen in that system. And so... Yeah, that was my slingshot moment or my rubber band moment of my darkness. It was like, wait a minute, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I was like, Pew! gonna go find it. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, I recently heard this cool thing about uh, worrying about stuff. And it's like, if you're worrying about something and the bad thing doesn't happen, right? Then you were worrying for nothing. Right. But if you worried about something and the bad thing does happen, well, now you suffered twice. So it's like, in either of those two cases, the worrying doesn't serve you at all. The only case in which I see the worry as serving is when you worry and that drives you towards productive, positive movement. Like it's, well, I, I'm worried about what's going to happen in society. And so I'm making sure that I have extra food ready and I'm making sure that yeah. I have a good community around me and, and that kind of thing. Like that kind of worry, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that's, that's like an internal drive versus like, I hope this thing doesn't, go sideways and it's like it might <laughs> right because there's a big difference between honoring your own internal drives and allowing them to unfold naturally and when you have some kind of a fixation in your brain and in your mind that's running this loop of i need to i need to i need to or what if what if what if what if or a blah, 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 you know whatever it is monkey mind mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. So do you have any kind of ways that you use to calm your monkey mind? <sighs> mm. 
Well, I'm pretty neurotic, so I, I generally do well with structure. Um, I need I need routines and structure, and that helps. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that you're in the monkey mind is a huge part of it, right? Mm -hmm. So that rather than trying like to stop it, you can just zoom out and say, "Oh, I'm caught in a loop." right <laughs> and like that can be a way to like true to break it or at least let it run its course because if you we're, we're sort of back to trying to control the weather now it's like oh, oh. i'm in this i'm in a storm <laughs> it's like what can i do as a coping mechanism to rather than try to not be in the storm to just mm. sit with my neuroticism to go about my day with my neuroses right so so then do you see that there's really nothing anything to do about anything at the end of the day yes the, okay. and and like the, 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 it, the question is why even be on this call why does the sun shine okay why does the grass grow i don't know but 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 clouds seem to do cloud things squirrels seem to do squirrel things maybe this is just toad doing toe things mm. that's why mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fair enough fair enough right i'm not on a crusade and i'm not on a crusade against crusades right i believe i even asked you if you wanted to partake so right and and i guess i did because here i am i don't know yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know isn't that a blessing? Uh, I have looked at the world through both of these different lenses, and it has been an extremely beneficial tool in my pocket to, to have this other set of glasses that I can put on and see things this other way, right? It's not that I'm living 24 seven in this purely passive, everything's the weather, Mm. It's just I I have this other way of viewing things, and I think if people had the ability, it's like you said, you're trying to teach people other ways of doing things or seeing things. I th mm -hmm. I think we'd have better health out outcomes, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've it already seen and. You know, I suppose it is controversial, although according to my perception of what I've seen as like the studies and the experiences and the stories is that people have literally cured cancer because of placebo. Like what the heck is going on there, you know? Dude, something like 95% of pharmaceuticals are placebos. <laughs> it's like a massive number, right? <laughs> it's like shit works because you believe it works. And can we... Like the implications of that are massive. Right, huge. Like, can we extrapolate what that means about your life stories and, and, and your personal beliefs? Like, well, it's why, it's why I have deep appreciation for Bashar because he gave me another teaching that every change is a total change. And so if I have a die and I, I like a six-sided die, like I were to roll, if I paint one side blue, it is no longer the same die as it was before. The entire Ooh. universe is the entire universe is different. Nothing is the same. This is what I mean when I say you can change the rules of the game. If you don't like it when you roll a six, paint it blue. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you can do that. It's it's your own game. It's your own life. It's your own experiment. And that's for me is what it comes down to is what works in your reality. What works for you? Yes. I don't care what the suits say in their ordinary studies of homogenized reality, wherein we tell you what the truth is. And like, sure, I mean, 40% of people it's like this or whatever. And you know what? I, I'm not a statistic. I'm beyond statistics. Yeah. Don't I'm put me in a box. Right. I'm an individual, you know, and you are too. Yeah. And you can be beyond statistics. <laughs> but people people want to be put in a box. People love boxes. See, those are the people I don't speak for. <laughs> it's unless, tough. unless if they want a more sophisticated box, I can give one for them.
You know, mm. I'm, I'm okay with that, especially if they're willing to throw some exchange my way. You know, I'm happy to share so, a new box. Yeah. Like if, if you really can't think for yourself and you need a new box, it's like, here, I'll give you a new box. It's okay. Yeah. Not a big deal. And, and that's a nice like meeting in the middle that's happening there because you're yeah. speaking to them on their terms rather than okay. saying, go beyond the boxes. Oh. It doesn't make any sense to someone who I mean, can only box. Precisely. And that could be terrifying. Like if it does, make any sense, if it does make any sense at all, it's the worst thing ever. It's like, no way. Yes. And so for those people, I'm, you know, I'm willing to give them a box or a triangle or a square or a pyramid, whatever it is they need. Or let the sleeping dogs lie. Right. Precisely. Hopefully they just don't bother me in the first place. <laughs> yeah. You can have harmony there. Right. Precisely. And I've been, I've been so much better at it ever since I learned that I don't have to initiate it that I can wait to respond to life when life gives me the opportunity to share what I have to say, I can share then. And by waiting for those moments, I have found so much more fulfillment, so much more satisfaction and so much less frustration. Well, you sound like you're satisfied. Oh. You, you sound like you're sincere, right? So it doesn't surprise me that you'd want to share that. Um, like I can only speak for myself. And this other perspective that I have has been immensely beneficial for me. So presumably it would be beneficial for other people too. Right. And this is what I believe truthfully is that if we're talking about the truth, it does not matter what words you are using to talk about it because they're all included. <laughs> and people know when you're bullshitting, like, we have very good well this is what's so funny to me this is what's so funny to me too is you know deepak chopra right sort of oh, okay sort of so essentially he is one of those people who has been ex who, who i would say he, he has a certain design that gives him certain proclivities to certain knowledge and in exploring this knowledge he would he totally opened his perception on reality to to the point where he can word soup at any moment mm. and people will say that sounds like an ai just made that up and it's like fake language and it doesn't mean anything except for if you look at it from his eyes you could actually see how it does make sense and so there's this problem where in his reality is so distant from ordinary that it's like bullshit that is not possible and from his perspective it's like oh it totally makes sense and like for me i can't listen to him because it's like so it's like maybe i could some days you know i Truthfully, I'd love to have a conversation with him. Like, I'd love to have a conversation with him, you know? The thing is, is if I listen to somebody like that and just listen to what they have to say nowadays, well, there's no telling how long I could actually make it. Like, maybe I'd enjoy it and I could listen for an hour, maybe five minutes, and I'd be like, ah, I'd rather just talk with you. Bye. Some people just don't resonate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's amazing that someone else can see bullshit and someone from his perspective, it's not. And both things can be true. Right. Right. There's not one. It doesn't need to be. It is or it isn't. <laughs> That's a duality again. <laughs> That's one thing I realized about arguments is everyone is always right from their perspective. And it's, it's, a, it's been really helpful for me to think about arguments in this way. Mm -hmm. like, like, what if we're all right? I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I work on that same front. We're either all right or we're all wrong. Either way, we're in this together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anytime I hear anyone preaching some version of like, this is how it is. It must be this way. Like, I don't know. I tune out. Yep. I, I disengage. It's another one of the jokes. And it's one of the jokes that actually belongs to me is I have an undefined Ajna center. And so the not self strategy for the undefined Ajna center is to pretend to be certain about something so as to not appear mentally weak. Yeah. Which, which and, to me looks like a form of weakness. Right. Right. And Any, anytime you like puff up your chest and try to present strength, that's, that's you're compensating for something, right? Unless you're say protecting something that could happen too. Right. But like usually it's because you don't feel strong. <laughs> so you need to project strength because right. you feel weak. You could think you're protecting something, but really you're just overcompensating for nothing. <laughs> happens a lot. Oh, yeah.
Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's why I like talking about the mechanics, because you're talking about like either somebody resonates or not. And I'm able to see through something simple as um, the lines. So like say I was saying, I have a one, three. Basically, there's one, two, and three. And then there's four, five, and six. And that makes up the lines. And so if somebody is, say, a five, two, they have no direct connection to my one, three. And so there's already a natural gap between us because there is a, a relationship between the one and the four, the two and the five, the three and the six. They're the above and the below of each other. And so like say for instance, as a one, three for me, my one and three are both in the personal destiny geometry, which means that for, for me moving through space time, it's around my personal destiny of where I'm going this lifetime. That's really what this lifetime is about. Whereas for people that are four, five and six, they're actually coming into this lifetime with a geometry that brings karmic connections to other people from the past. And so it's like they have allies out there where it's like, oh, yes, thank you. Or, or even enemies out there of, oh, wow, I need to make you a friend now this time or something like that. And so they have people that they have karma with them. And so the, there are different stages in this progression that makes up the whole thing. And so like I can describe and I can know why someone does or doesn't really resonate with me due to various aspects and all the mechanics of all the details of all the stuff. And for the most part, I don't really get into all that stuff because I could, I could literally talk forever and have no idea where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. But um, if, someone, if someone's yeah. only talking about where we've been, then it's probably not going to resonate, right? I literally, I never cared about history for the mo for the majority of my my life as a human being. It's like that's already done. I don't that I don't I don't care about stuff anymore. Like I want to talk about this one. Like what are we doing right now? Yeah. And even since I was a child, I've always been that way. It's, it's not until I got into design, of course, because it gives me this perspective. So there's there's the human design which is essentially what happens when you take the microscope into a person and look into what happens in that person or when they're in relationship with other people, looking into the micro. And then there's what's called rave cosmology, which is when you take that microscope and turn it into a telescope and you look out at the stars. Hmm. And so it's not until rave cosmology became a thing in my life that I started to care more about history because I now have a context that I could place any moment in history within. And I can gain more awareness of what was going on in that moment by looking at the context. And like, I, I still remember it was when I was door dashing, of course, I had finished the 100 hour lecture series on rave cosmology. And I think it might've been like maybe four or 5 PM and I, I closed out my dash and I opened the car door and I just sat there looking at the sky and feeling this shift happening on the inside, not even really thinking anything. Maybe there's a little bit of some kind of a thought in there and it's just like, wow. My perspective on reality is never going to be what it was before. And I didn't even comprehend what I'd listened to. It's not until I did it again that it started to make more sense. <laughs> that I can begin to communicate it. <laughs> but you talk about there being magic everywhere all around us, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's this idea of stop and smell the roses. Like, how often do we... One of the pitfalls I see is you spend so much time looking up the, the conceptual stuff and like, yes, I get it. Like people like to have a framework. They like to get a deeper knowledge of things. But if, if all you do is, is get into the nitty gritty maps and, and I call it sauce, it's just sauce, man. Oh yeah. Like, if you yeah. If all you're doing is eating sauce and you're not going out there living, 
that's it. Like at the if end of the day, make, like if you don't know how to make your own sauce. What are you doing? <laughs> I, I like, I think kids are born with this source code where they engage with the world, they engage with the magic and, and it gets slowly beaten out of us, right? Through conditioning. Mm -hmm. And we get these little glimpses now and then. Maybe it's you stop your door dash and you, you open the car door and you look at the sky and just connect to the magic. Like, holy shit, this is it. Absolutely. It's so easy not to see when you're in that rat race, when your head's in the books, when you're... Mm. It's not that there's no value to the books right. and the maps. It's, it's, it's like everything else in life. Yeah. It's... It's another element that I'm grateful for is like, I was given this piece of information and it's like, oh, okay, I can find my fulfillment in this life through my mind, me personally. That's what, that's where I can find fulfillment. And then seeing there's three other styles of fulfillment that a person can find. The, the second one is that they can find it through the form, through like building things. Maybe it's a literal building or a church or a cathedral or a school or something. Maybe that's really fulfilling for them in life. Maybe for somebody else, it's their personal relationships and their bonds with other people is that for them, it's always about the other person and how they're connecting. And, and the fourth one is for people who is all about their own unique change, their own unique answer to the question that is posed by the fact that you will one day die. It's like, what am I going to do about this? Yes. And for some people, that's the only way they can be fulfilled. They won't find it anywhere else other than there. But people struggle with this question of what do I do with this information? And it's like, I don't know. Like you you gotta you gotta right. It's this idea in yoga of like the main reason we suffer is not knowing who we are. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you need to find what works for you. And I can't tell you that. I can, I can show you the buffet. I can offer you a bunch of different flavors, but you need to taste test them and figure out which one you like. Right. Right. Like, don't defer that power to me. <laughs> That's self-abuse. Yeah. <laughs> and, and too many people will be happy to take that power and, yeah. and tell you what your flavor is. And it's like, nah, man. And I mean, yeah, part of the journey for me is allowing them to have their trip. Yeah. So I can't do anything about that. I got to let them like, that's, that's what they're here for. All right. That's what you're here for. I talk about, I can't walk your path for you. True. Right? I can walk alongside you. I can, I can talk to you, but your path is your path, right? But people want to come and surrender and say, show me, tell me. And it's like, I can walk with you. We can, we can try to figure it out together, but I, I can't tell you. Right. And that's the, that's the funniest thing of all is even with all of the mechanical stuff that I have a grasp on, like I could tell you about yourself to kingdom come and none of it matters whatsoever if you're you're simply looking for more information from more people to have more information to finally find the answer yes because if if you're not ready to live it you won't hear any of it and it wouldn't have meant anything yeah if you're just if you're just trying to get more information to get more information to get more information and it's like you're you're gonna die at some point and it might be tomorrow so mm -hmm. like what do you want to do with that information right like, are, you, are you gonna live today? Down and think think about it yeah that, that's what it comes down for me it's like are you going to live today because like, you could spend 30 years with your head in the sand and then the terminal illness diagnosis comes along and it's like well holy shit all of that information what did it do for me what do i do now like the a big part of it is getting people to run out of road and realize that like Everyone's clinging for these life preservers. And it's like, there is no life preserver. Uh -huh. right? We're all skydiving out of plane with no parachute. So you can, you can try to fabricate a parachute in midair, 
or you can do a few flips along the way and then but uh, when I look around, I see a lot of people trying to craft parachutes. Well, I mean, that makes sense. If you can, if you can try, I mean, if, sure. If, if, if you can figure out a way to do it, then fine. It's, it's a valid approach, but I would rather do a few somersaults and enjoy the ride. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Like if you're, if you're lacking enjoyment of the tricks and the plays and the games you could have along the way at the expense of, oh, hey, this is going to end eventually. I'd rather it didn't. And I'm going to suffer forever because I'm going to make sure it doesn't ever end. And oh, hey, it ended anyway. Dang it. <laughs> okay, try again. <laughs> you get another jump. Right. You can try again. Maybe you'll have fun this time. Yeah. <laughs> but the way I see it, like the process is the point. So if you want to if you want to make the parachute, if you want to go on the crusade, it's fine. But ideally, you would be enjoying it along yes. the way. Yes. If you're not enjoying it, if you're not feeling alive along the way, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the dog's kind of loud. I think. No, it's all good. So that should give you like a decent sense of sort of what I'm about. Yeah, it does. It gives me a great taste of, well, simply how, say, profoundly you, you are. You give a lot of space and room for me to be me without that ever being a problem. And you also don't engage with a lot of stuff that isn't you that a lot of people engage with. Like what? <sighs> Yeah, trying to find specific words for the feeling I'm seeing. It's, it's the sense of like when you're saying, yeah, don't beat yourself up, of course. Yeah. You know, don't, don't behave and exist outside of integrity. And so essentially what I say is it's refreshing to be able to be around another young person who's integrity, who they got it. Like you're, you're living your life and I'm, you know, I'm happy to meet you and have a conversation with you. Yeah. Uh, there was a, I don't know if it's relevant, but I was just thinking about someone yesterday in our discord server, she was talking about how she wants to preserve the flowers so everyone else can enjoy them right doesn't doesn't want to doesn't want to touch it doesn't want to interact with it because mm. you might damage it you might ruin it but i think it's great and it's like obviously that's a noble intention right yeah, right but my point was if everyone was only prioritizing the preservation of the flowers so that others could enjoy them then we'd all be preserving flowers and no one would be enjoying them. True that. So it's like, practice what you preach, touch the flower, enjoy the flower. Like it's, it's gonna wilt anyway. So like, have, have the integrity of your own. If, if you think enjoying the flowers is what it's about, then walk that walk and enjoy that flower. Mm -hmm. Right, and others can 100%. learn from that, rather than like putting a glass dome on it and like blocking out the sun. In, a, in an attempt to preserve it, you end up killing it. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you really wanted to honor that beauty that's in front of you, you have to engage with it to appreciate it. Yeah, and it has to be in the moment. It has to be in real life. It can't be like a thought experiment. I mean, that's part of it. That's part of the moment is thought experiments. And yet the feeling in your body. That's where the flower is. Yes. It's in the senses. Like, does the flower exist outside of your senses? Hmm. We're, like, we're back to that wetness idea. Is, is there that kind of wetness up here? Right. There's only the reflection of it in your mind. It's not the actual thing. This is Plato's cave, right? Mm -hmm. Like that wetness it can't compare to jumping in a lake. Right. 
right. and that's why like for me that's why i pay homage to the pranayama uh, as a as a thing that i think is truly valuable because any doubter if you doubt the power of your body simply it's self-evident there it is right you can literally feel it and see it in your body in the moment and go oh hold on that oh. feels different something's going on what is that yeah or you'll be like oh, 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 i can't even i need to practice first before i can even do that but it's not inhale exhale it, it's it's not that it's no it's the organic chemistry in your body doing things and what that feels like <laughs> and you can connect with it like it's, yes. it's always there you just don't notice it always until you're dead you know you can count on it being there and you can form a relationship with it you can trust it you know yeah and that's, that's the yeah that's the beauty that's good stuff uh, yeah i, I want to ask you could you share anything more about your painting in the back I i'd love to hear something on it yeah i don't know it's just um a part of when i was going through that grace period in 2019 was i started oil painting and there's there's a very natural connection in my mind between art and what i think of as enlightenment because mm. it's this it's this direct engagement with like the magic all around us mm -hmm. and it's like a celebration of that yeah. and, and it's, it's getting into the moment into the process and i have my own theories and philosophies about art and it's very process oriented and mm -hmm. i don't i don't prioritize the piece at all right i just I paint to paint and if if like an expert saw my process they'd be like what the hell are you doing <laughs> i'm using these like expensive canvases and oil paints and i'm using a palette knife and i'm just spreading it around like peanut butter and i have to keep cleaning the knife so i'm wiping it on the page and it like all of this expensive paint is just going straight into the garbage but <laughs> but like we're just going straight into the garbage too right like there's a reflection of we pay people to preserve art their their jobs their profession is right art preserving mm -hmm. why well because it's all decaying around us at all times so rather than being precious and trying to hold on to things like i i i my number one client is the garbage i throw out like 90 percent of my pieces wow. because the, the piece isn't the point right uh -huh. Uh -huh. i'm just it's like dancing it's engaging in the process and sometimes you hit a home run and you get magic and sure like i'll keep that one but I know damn well, like my body and the paintings, they're all going to the same place, right? I don't care, like every Van Gogh painting, it's it's gonna disintegrate at some point. Every, yeah. even, even a digital record of it, that's gonna eventually. be gone eventually. So that's sort of my philosophy around art. Um, mm. And as a result, ever since having this like philosophical change i've been really into um performance art and contemporary art nice um because it's so obvious what the point of it is and i understand why people don't get it um mm -hmm. two quick examples of that uh, <laughs> probably the best piece of contemporary art I've ever seen was in our um, 
our, our National Gallery here, there's one piece where I turned the corner and like I walked into like the exhibit and it literally took my breath away. Yeah. I was like, and all it is, is a cable running from one corner of the room diagonally down to the other corner. And it just, it just splits the room in half. Mm. It's just like a little wire, like you've got in the background there. That's the piece, right? And I didn't even look, I didn't look at the artist. I didn't look at the name on the card because that's the like Plato's cave stuff. That's this, <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Right. But, but the immediate experience of that piece, it was just like pure engagement with with the magic in front of me. Mm -hmm. Like I like I know what this piece is about. Like I'm experiencing it right right now. Like you can't not engage with something like that. It's like it grabs you. Right. And an, another example of like performance art was I was at the gallery and there was people uh, gathering for a performance art piece. And there was a woman with a wall covered in duct tape. And she started ripping the tape off the wall. And the crowd was getting bigger and forming. And she started like screaming as she was pulling the tape off the wall. Like, ah! And, and I could tell that half the crowd was like, wait a minute they were waiting for the image to show up of like the polar bear in the duct tape or whatever. And I was like, nah, like this is the piece. <laughs> right. You are experiencing it. Right. And I think it was about what it's like to be an indigenous person and to like, like you just can't, you just can't grab that piece of tape and the frustration and and it's like this visceral thing and it's like holy shit this is the piece it's not the stupid image at the end right but i could i could tell half the people around me sort of didn't didn't get that and we're very yeah, confused at least yeah. <laughs> i mean the journey as the destination is not an easy acceptance and it's really tough oh. to explain yeah because it's like, where are we going? We're going here. Where, where, else, where else is there but here? <laughs> Show me something other than this, please. So it's like the ultimate Occam's razor is just... Being right? present. It's, it's, it's holding up the flower. Yeah. Like, this is it. It's here. It's now. This is all there ever is. Mm -hmm. And appreciate it while it's here. You know, right. if you can. If you're looking for the answers elsewhere, where else is there to look? I don't know. It's it's eternally right around the bend. Always. This is something that I notice <laughs> when I spend time on like Reddit. Notice every month you'll see you'll see a post and it's like, guys, did you feel that change? There was a big shift in energy. And it's always it's like, guys, the big change is always just around the corner. And it has been for thousands of years. Oh, yeah. And it's like, it's fine if you want to believe that. It's cool. Like, but. <laughs> I, I would recommend looking for the change here and now, right? Agreed. Because I don't know where else you could find it. No point being preoccupied in what you could imagine the future might be. And there's no point in being preoccupied in what you remember the past was. I mean, there are things you can do in relationship with those cognitions. And at the same time, if it takes over your present, if it takes over your right now, and you can't live life and you don't smell the rose you missed it you're right right you had it all along and you missed it which is fine i i see value in missing it uh, but i i want to enjoy the ride absolutely and just like all those those people on on their deathbed going hey there's something you can realize right now 
that's where it is. We don't have to wait till death to realize the truth. But you have to go looking for it. You and have to go on your own journey. It's worth the struggles and the trials and the tribulations. Yeah. In my experience, I can vouch for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, do, do you have anything else that kind of draws you that might be important to say? No, we're at what, like about 90 minutes? Yeah, I think we're around that wrap, around that yeah. bend. I think, I think we both got a good sense of like what we're about, the flavors. Yeah, I hope I was able to share a little bit about what I'm into without going too far into anything. And No, I didn't, I didn't know much about the human design framework, so I appreciate that. Yeah, wonderful. Nice. So if you wanna if you wanna send me the link, uh, I, I I believe I have your your link for the book. Okay. That's easily findable. And then if if you yeah. send one over for the, you, I believe you have a Discord for the book, right? Uh, I have a Discord that's just a really cool um, community. Like I'm I'm a key player in it, but it's not my Discord. It's not about my book. It's oh okay. Yeah, you, you would probably love it. Um, well, feel free to send that over. I could include that. Link. If you yeah. think it's a good for inclusion with the video here, then I'll include it as well. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, it has a very similar vibe to our discussion in the sense Wonderful. that like, non, neither of us are trying to prove anything here. We're, it's not a pissing contest. It's not an argument, right? It's like we're actually open-minded and just sharing our stories. Yeah. So I'll, I'll drop that link. Um, Wonderful. I also started a Discord that I think is a good idea towards like doing proper, like deep discussion and inquiry. But I won't. I won't. Probably won't drop that link. You can. You can find me. Whatever. Ah, there so we go. So that'll be for the the hunters later on who want yes. it. Maybe they'll find it in your other in the Discord you're able to link. So. There you go. Yeah, for the seekers, there is always a way, you know. Yeah, but I'm down to um, I'm down to do this again, if you if you ever want to talk about something. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. we go like more specific on a topic or something. But this was fun. Yeah, absolutely. I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation, and so I look forward to being able to see you again sometime and seeing you online and around and all that kind of good stuff. Good man. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, until next time, Tom. And everyone else, we'll see you later. Hope you have a wonderful day. You too, man. Mm -hmm. Peace out. Okay, we're going to stop this.